Well, yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I love that segue. Uh, that's a new one for me. Um, I really, really appreciate that. So thank you. What a great, great conversation and um, an eye-opening one uh, about gaming, and particularly about how gamers uh, seem to have got through the pandemic in a better way uh, than non-gamers. I never even considered that. So now we move to the final plenary panel of the day called Creating a Path to a New Normal. And to lead a stellar cast of online safety characters, we have a dear friend of ours, Laura Higgins. Laura is the Director of Community Safety and Digital Civility at Roblox, which in itself is a very cool title. I don't think that title really existed a few years ago, Community Safety and Digital Civility. Um, I also just want to take a quick moment before we move to the panel to also mention that Emma Morris, who worked for FOSI for the past 12 years and who worked on this conference right up until she left us at the end of July, has just had her first full day at Roblox as Director of US Public Policy. So we wish her well in her new role. Uh, so please, Laura, take it away. Um. Um, thank you. That was a lovely introduction, Stephen. Um, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here to do this. And so thank you, everyone, for joining us for this last session of the day. I know it's been a jam-packed event. Um, there's been some incredible speakers, and certainly I know I've got a lot of takeaways and topics that I want to dig into much more as well. Um, obviously, I'd love to just thank Fozy for putting together an amazing event, as always, and to all the contributors. Um, I know Obviously, today's topic was always going to be tough. The last few years have been really challenging. Um, we've all had to sort of make these sacrifices. We've heard some of the impact it's had on young people. But hopefully in this last session, we're going to be able to bring together some of this learning that we've had over the last couple of years and perhaps look into the future and even some of the optimism and, and, and you know how we can really create better and safer and nicer spaces online based on what we've learned. So um, I'm pretty certain our panel doesn't need that much of an introduction. Um, many of them have spoken here at FOSI before, um, but obviously it's really important that you get to know everyone on the panel. I'm going to start. Um, Catherine, could you introduce yourself first, please? Thank you, Lauren. Thanks, Fozzie. It's great to be back. Um, my name is Catherine steiner Dare. I am the author of The Big Disconnect, Protecting Childhood and Family Relationships in the Digital Age. In 2011, I decided to do a deep dive and research some of the fallout, if you will, of and the impact on kids' uh, cognitive, social, psychological, and uh, development of technology And when I was at Harvard Med School. So I set out to do a big piece of research, and I wrote a book, the book uh, that I just told you. And since then, actually, up until the pandemic began, March 14th, I was grounded. Uh, I spent every week just about working in schools, mostly, but also at conferences. And everywhere I go, I would work with kids beginning from eight years old all the way to 18. I would work with faculty. I would work with parents. So I was really in the trenches doing ongoing uh, education prevention outreach, trying to help everybody involved minimize the risk and find the best ways to possibly use technology at home and in education. It's been a whirlwind of a experience. There was no research when I began and thankfully there's tons now. Amazing, thank you, Catherine. Um, Tessie, please can you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, it's so lovely to be back um, at FOSI again. My name is Tessie Ojo and I'm the Chief Executive of the Diana Ward, a charity legacy to Princess Diana. A charity that's really focused on driving change for young people. Our work involves three key areas around unlocking the potential of young people, um, creating change, creating opportunities for young people and inspiring change. But aside from that, part of our work has meant over the last, say, 20 years, we've really championed behavior management, looking at, we've generally championed um, how to make sure that young people thrive and looking at the factors that prevent them thriving. So one of those be around behavior. How do we ensure that young people um, have good relationships in school? Because we know that if they have breakdown in relationships, that leads to absenteeism. When we have absenteeism, young people do not 
therefore achieve the right grades. And that behavior management program kind of led us to create an anti-bullying program, which is one of the largest in the UK and Ireland, um, that really trains young people to take responsibility for the well-being of their peers. That piece of work, this was way before kind of the online world became a thing, then grew into working alongside the Duke of Cambridge to set up the very first Royal Tax Force on Cyberbullying, which really brought together um, tech and comms giant in the chief execs of the tech and comms industry to really begin to look at how do we help shape behavior online? How do we help make sure that when young people are online that they are safe? In my other hat, I am the co I'm the chair of um, an, a 70 million pounds fund, which is called the I Will Fund. The I Will Fund is a movement that sets up for young people to um, ignite change, to allow young people to take their place in society, helping them stand up for the change they want to see. So on one hand, it's really great to, in my day job, inspire change. And in my other job, which is not paid, by the way, um, I just yeah. get to do it for me. <laughs> um, I get to fund projects where young people are actually standing up for making change happen. Um, and I know we are going to move on to our other panellists in one moment, but I have noticed you do have some letters after your name now, Tessie. I think it would be very remiss for me not to mention that. I do indeed. I, yes, I am a commander of the British Empire. Huh? Therefore, I am Lady Tessie Ojo. Thank you very much. Oh, Congratulations. You've always Tessie. been a lady to us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Congratulations, Tessie. I'm, we're all really, really proud of you. So, um, yeah, fantastic. Um, Andy, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yeah. Um, my name is Andy Shabilsky. Uh, I'm a professor uh, at the University of Oxford, and I'm nominally uh, director of research at something called the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary research institute. So. The idea is that computer scientists, philosophers, psychologists, uh, we work together to study the, the implications of, of what online life is uh, from, from our different disciplinary backgrounds and perspectives. Uh, and and uh, most of my time is spent um, trying to think through and to study what, what does it mean for, for things online or, or things in games or things in kind of virtual settings to actually have effects on, on young people and, and on adolescents throughout development. And like, what would constitute evidence that scientific evidence, as opposed to opinions or anecdotes that, that would um, change minds or change practices, either in government or, or in parents um, or, or in other areas of regulation that are particularly underserved uh, by a pretty systematic multi-decade brain drain uh, uh, out of academia and out of the civil sector uh, uh, as technology companies grow and, and, and build environments uh, that many young people spend most of their lives in, uh, waking lives <laughs> for now. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, and so I, I have no letters uh, after my name besides a, a long Polish surname, uh, but, but I'm really uh, lucky to be here and happy to be joined by, by everyone else. I'm sure the letters are coming. Don't worry, Andy. You're doing amazing work. <laughs> thank you so much. And last but definitely not least, um, thank you so much, Julie, for uh, joining us at a slightly less um, appropriate time of the day. Um, Julie, could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you, Fozi, for having me back. It's one of my favorite conferences of the year, every year consistently. Um, but I'm Julian McGrant. I'm the Australian eSafety Commissioner. We were established in 2015 as the world's first online harms regulator, and our statutory role is to lead, coordinate, educate around online safety so that we can help our citizens have safer, more positive experiences online. So I am the regulator formerly known as the tech policy and safety representative, variously from Microsoft, Twitter, and then Adobe. So after 22 years in the tech industry, I guess this makes me a bit of a poacher turned gamekeeper. And I guess uh, it's worth noting that while we at eSafety remove harmful content online, I still believe that regulation alone is not going to be sufficient to help us reach that uh, 
real safety in state. So we bolster our protection or in our protective schemes with preventions on the front end to really institute behavioral change across the Australian population, you know, starting with um, evidence-based resources um, for parents of under fives, because we know that 42% of children by the age of two have access to a digital device, and by the time they're four, that's 95%. So prevention on the front end, and that goes, I guess, cradle to grave, all the way up to the Be Connected program, which is for senior citizens, which are actually the least represented population online, but the most vulnerable to scams and social engineering. So we've got that on the front end and on the back end of protection is what I call proactive and systemic change. I'll talk a little bit about safety by design, which is one of those initiatives. But we also have tech trends and challenges briefs because we all know that technology moves faster than policy and we want to be able to anticipate risk and head it off. Um, look at positive use cases, um, but also where technology can be misused and go wrong. And I think many of us know human beings have found many creative ways over the years to be able to game and misuse technology. Thank you, Julie. Um, uh, yeah, it's just wonderful, like I say. I couldn't have picked a better panel, um, so I'm so grateful for you all being here to share your, your insights with us. Um, the beautiful thing of having the final session of the day is that we've all had an opportunity to sort of join some of the sessions and, and to reflect on some of the, you know, the different speakers who've been on. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear if any of you have seen anything you really wanted to comment on or that struck you. Um, certainly the report that's come out today, uh, there's a couple of things I'd love to comment on, but is there, is, does anyone have anything they'd like to, to add first? Well, I'll go. I think when I first started doing this work, I think when we all started doing this work, um, there was a tendency for parents to say, oh, the schools aren't doing enough. Why can't the schools just solve all the problems? And then I'd go work with the faculty and they say, oh, those darn parents, you know, they're just not paying any attention <laughs> to their kids. And I hear that still. I still hear the tension between who owns the physical, mental, emotional safety and health and well-being of our kids. Um, and I think that uh, it, what I heard today was some really exciting uh, developments in, in remarkable resources available to parents in terms of safety and health, and a real challenge to get this, the, this these generations, if you will, of parents to pay attention, including, in my experience, where I also work with parents of preschoolers. I'm curious to see if you see this in Australia, but you're so far ahead of us in what we do here. Who, parents who just think their kids are all right, and they know better. So there's, there's, you know, there's something going on that we need to um, do at, at a cultural level, really to, to make it completely normal to uh, imbue family life and education with a heightened awareness, not fear, but an awareness that so much of life is online, that we all are involved collectively and collaboratively to make this a far safer, and better protected experience of childhood for our kids. Um, so I have some thoughts about how to do that, but that was my first thought. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. Um, certainly for me, reading the report really resonated. Um, at Roblox, we, we carried out our own survey over the summer um, of kids here in the UK and doing just a quick comparison of, of the findings that we've seen today compared to what we saw with our small qualitative group. Um, one of the things really stood out with this Gen X is we know what we're meant to do, but we don't always do it. And that, that's mm -hmm. just such an interesting thing. Of, um, actually, the fact they're being insightful and honest about that is really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and what actually struck me is um, it's not necessarily about us talking them into doing it, but role modeling it ourselves, because it was particularly things about excessive screen time and turning your phone off at bed. And, and so rather than just putting all the weight of the responsibility on them, it is about actually they, they are seeing us do exactly the same thing. So that really struck me earlier. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so um, obviously the world has changed significantly. Uh, we've been living through this pandemic and very much living online. How do you guys think the conversation around online safety specifically has changed? I'm going to throw it to you I, first, Julie. <laughs> I have a view. Um, if I can just um, make a point on, on Catherine's 
really important point. Um, you know, now that we've been at this for about six years, we've actually actually seen real behavioral change. So back in 2017, we do a parent survey every year and a youth-based survey. 55% um, of young people would talk to a parent or a trusted adult when something went wrong online. It's now gone up to 66% in, um, in a short period. We started something called the Start the Chat campaign, which was really to all parents to just be engaged in their kids' online lives. They are the way they are, their everyday lives, and think about teaching them to you know, we talk about the four R's of the digital age, respect, responsibility, building digital resilience and critical reasoning skills um, and teaching basic digital hygiene like we do uh, brushing our teeth and washing hands. So we're actually seeing behavioral change when you use that evidence based uh, research to um, underpin your messaging and you're not using pedagogies that instill fear or judgment. Mm -hmm. So, and those pedagogies are really important. We put out a, um, a framework based on um, a lot of David Finkelhor's work um, and other mm -hmm. global experts. But I just wanted to say as a uh, technology optimist, um, what really gives me a lot of heart, and I woke, to, woke up at 4, 4 a.m. to um, join the metaverse conversation. Um, but I really think we're reaching that point where safety in the online world, whether it is in the metaverse or it's in the decentralized web 3.0 world, is a forethought rather than an afterthought. <laughs> and I was just thinking about 10 years ago when I was inside the tech sector and I brought the concept of safety by design to one of my employers and I literally got an eye roll, you know, mm -hmm. something about, you know, we're never going to be your own a social media company. And a few years later, I got a more enthusiastic response from um, uh, than the tech CEO I was working for, who was very excited about technology empowerment tools. Well, he really had no answer as to whether putting the burden for safety totally upon the user was enough, and 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 you know didn't really understand that concept that we user empowerment technology is important, but not if it, the burden's totally on them. And so I fast mm -hmm. forward to 2017 and I think about um, my fireside chat with Steven and that immediate recognition when I drew the analogy to the automotive industry pushing back on Congress more than 50 years ago when they were in required to invest heavily in safety and embed seat belts to prevent you know, escalating road fatalities. You know, of course, now we take for granted that safety is built into our cars by design and that car companies actually buy for that five star safety rating mm -hmm. and they try and differentiate themselves based on premium safety features. So I really hope that tech, the technology industry is having their seatbelt moment, which means that they're really fixing the fundamentals first and understand that no marketing messaging or press release of the latest WizBan Wiz feature is going to resonate unless the overall online experiences of our, our consumers and customers are made much more positive, civil, and ultimately safe. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Tessie, have you seen a change, you know, thinking about the anti-bullying pro project that you do? What, has, has that process had to change, even thinking about, you know, kids not being in school? How have you managed to, to do some of those projects? Yeah, no, that's, I'm really, I'm just, I'm just fascinated by this conversation, even before I come to, to the question. I know, like Julie said, and everyone else has said, for so that just that shift in balance, you know, at the start, it was all about um, the tech industry's responsibility. And at some point, it was actually, what's the role of parent? And we're almost coming to that point where we always come back to this whole village mentality that it takes all of us. Everyone has mm -hmm. a responsibility to keep everybody safe. And until we're all safe, no one's safe, um, because any one new death is one too many. And, you know, we we should that in terms of that aspiration, where do we want to be? Where do we want to go? Um, is that absolute safety by design where it almost I, I when I think about 10 years from now, when perhaps someone who's five is 15 at a time uh, in 10 years time and begins to say did you never have this before and then you know that rolling of eye moment and say what took you guys so long i'm hoping that at that stage we will be like well it took us long but we got there eventually you know one of the things that we saw at the Diane award um from i talked about our behavior program was at the start of lockdown just from the pandemic we knew that when you know, when young people were, um, when young, when when we had lockdown, the first thing we did was 
Laura, like you said, to, to ask young people, how, what are your anxiety? What are you worried about? Like, how are you, what are your biggest fears? Interestingly, what we thought was, we were kind of shocked a little bit by the, by the outcome because the top three things young people told us at the time was unsurprisingly, firstly, mental well-being, just that mm -hmm. absolute fear that I'm cut away from my friends. I don't have a, you know, if just um, the anxiety, the mental, the isolation and everything else. I think what a lot of people didn't realize at the time was actually for, whereas in school, we focus a lot on absenteeism, on attendance. What we didn't realize was the, the number of people who actually go into school to escape as a, as a form of escapism from stuff happening at home. And when lockdown happened, that was the first thing that hit a lot of, especially here in the UK, a lot of frontline delivery people that actually young people being locked up at home was causing more harm than what we thought. You know how we had always said, oh, the school playground is bad, there's bullying in school. But actually what we began to see was that shift that young people being at home, there was there was increased rate of uh, mental mental anxiety. The other thing that really struck us from that survey was actually how about 70%, and this was a bit another surprise, 70% of young people telling saying to us that they were worried about not being able to help in their communities, seeing all of the stuff that was going on online. Now, for a lot of people who believe that young people are entitled, young people are... Um, lazy and all of the words that are associated with young people this was for us at the time what it was not a surprise but i think once we published the results that was a big shock because our young people were saying we see what's going on around we want to help but we are in lockdown we can't help and just not being able to help was costing us anxiety and then the third area of concern unsurprisingly was around safety young people themselves were concerned about the whole world is online. We have let our guards down generally because everybody was online and they were worried about the impact of that. So for us, we began to look at those three things. How do we, A, knowing that everyone had to be online, how do we help young people navigate the online world? You know, there were things that were popping up that I'd never heard. I think I had a birthday just shortly after lockdown. And I can't remember the name of the app. It was some form of party next door app or something where you could just have a party with random people. The kind of things you would never do in real life. Suddenly, everybody was, you were using any, any means possible to talk to people around you. You were texting people that naturally you probably wouldn't text and suddenly letting our, our guards down and we began to look at those three things how do we support, help young people navigate being able to play safely online stay safely online yet not completely let your guards down how do we help them be involved in community social action from their bedroom without leaving home so that they're safe and the third bit is how do we help young people build resilience how do we just help them cope with all of the uncertainties even though we no one had answers it was the beginning of lockdown no one knew what would happen yet you have to help young people manage their own mental well-being whilst dealing with all of the uncertainty as well as everything else happening online thank you tessie so i'm actually going to pick up on two of those points um andrew i'm going to come to you first we've spoken about this uh before um, you know, they're, they're, and to Tessie's point, you know, we know that there have been real changes and some of them have been quite negative. When we talk to young people, which all of us have had the opportunity to do at some point through lockdown and the pandemic, we're hearing about things that are really affecting young people. But what's quite often being reflected in the media is not necessarily those same things that people, that people are actually experiencing. It's quite sensational. We've seen, you know, fears about you know, addiction. Uh, you know, rather than just, you know, looking at a screen time in a more holistic way, things like loot boxes and gambling connections and those sorts of things. Obviously, uh, you know, in terms of your academic work, what, what sorts of things have you actually seen? What, what's been coming up for you over the last couple of years? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be slightly maybe more negative uh, than, than uh, others on this. Um, you know, 
I'll, I'll preface this by saying that the, the reason why I'm involved in this area is I originally wanted to know what makes video games fun and, and how we would study them to make video games more psychologically, not addictive, but kind of engaging as a, as a, a place that encourages flourishing and social connection. And, and I learn by examples. I learn by reading examples from other fields and, and other kinds of science. And, and to be entirely candid, the, the last 40 years of, of studying online spaces and, and digital spaces has been a, a reactive waste of time and resources. Uh, so there are thousands of studies on video games that are pointless. Uh, there are hundreds and probably thousands of studies about social media addiction. Uh, which aren't worth the, the the paper that they're not written on because they're all PDFs now, uh, and 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 I want I, I want to say that like some tremendously high percentage of of the reactions that social scientists and charities and other groups had to the pandemic really shows warts and all how much a, a, a reactive stance to technology has really rotted the the, the intellectual and scientific infrastructure uh, of our society. So everyone asked. What does COVID have? What does COVID mean for me? What does COVID mean for my hobby horse? And and whether uh, unfortunately whether it's research about suicide or self harm, or video game addiction or or any of the areas I vaguely know anything about, um, people had really really miscalibrated expectations about either the utility of their worldview or the utility of their science. Uh, uh, in places where this was testable, we found we really don't know what the hell what the heck makes young people tick, many of them were much more resilient. And it's because we never really bothered to have a really good idea of, or a definition of, of what is resilience in young people. We just knew we needed resilience to slap onto the side of something to um, help them in some abstract way. Um, and so, you know, using games as an example, um, there was an idea that, you know, all these young people socializing online would lead to an epidemic of video games addiction. Nobody bothers to define video games. Nobody bothers to define what the word addiction means. And nobody bothers to actually check if kids played more video games. And, and I can tell you that the first problem is that games companies keep their data to themselves. So it's hard to test directly. And when we indirectly tested it, we found, yeah, for the first two weeks of lockdown, people played like an hour more a day of video games. And, and, and across 2020, People were more likely to play on weekdays and weekends because they weren't showing up to school or work or commuting. But but the numbers went down to, to, to baseline, like really quickly within weeks. And, and sure, if you take annual snapshots because you have a childlike social science that believes things happen on a yearly basis instead of minutes or seconds or decades or whatever, a uh, better basis for your research question, you, you know, you're, you're going to come up with all kinds of nonsense. And, and, and I'll say that, yeah, Julie is absolutely right that Julie is absolutely right that like technology is moving really fast. But in, in the UK, when I came here, I read something called the Byron Review. It was this kind of quasi systematic multi stakeholder review about what the heck the role of technology is in the lives of young people and what are the outstanding questions in terms of their mental health and their psychological resilience. And we have spent tens of millions of pounds in this country and not answered a single damn thing in that report. In, 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 in 12 or 13 years, I don't know how to subtract because I've had young kids in the interim. And I'll say COVID hasn't changed any of that. Nobody's answering the fundamental questions. They've just taken certain words out and replaced it with online harms and they're just being reactive again. And it's crazy that we're in 2021 after a global pandemic and Mark Zuckerberg is the only guy, person, who's like, I have a crazy idea about what society and the metaverse are. I have no idea what it means, any of it. But he's like one of the only people who has a convinced idea of what he thinks society and commerce and the internet should be that's like in any way coherent. And sure, it's capitalist and American and whatever, but it's the kind of thing, that, it's the way you have to think about this stuff. And so the question is, do we want to have a society? I'm going to lecture mode, I'm sorry. But like the question is, what kind of society do we want to have? Because science, science isn't there. And, and I, you know, I was very deliberate in my asking you of that question because, you know, I think all of us on this panel and everyone who I've heard speak today, 
you know, what we want to do is, is not to get on a soapbox and talk about these big topics. We genuinely want to make sure that the, safe, the spaces that people are using online are safe and healthy and positive places. And when it comes particularly to talking to parents, to give them factual, research-based, realistic and helpful advice, rather than giving them things that they just worry about and, and don't know how to fix. So, um, And I'll just say, yeah, to, and, to, and to interrupt, I'll say Stan's last point in, in the previous session uh, uh, is exactly right, that this is the kind of conversation that parents are supposed to be having their kids. But, you know, that was common sense before I was a parent. Mm -hmm. That was common sense when, when my father was a parent. And he didn't need a silly social science study to say, I don't want my kid playing violent video games. He, he had values as a parent. And, and no one dressed like me has helped make parents' jobs any easier in the last decade with science. Yeah, and in, in fact, in Australia, parents told us 95% of parents said that online safety is their preeminent parenting challenge. Yet only 10% will go actively seek out online safety information until something goes wrong. And so we know that parents are increasingly busy, particularly during the pandemic. We were remote working and remote schooling and doing all those things. But we have to find other ways to reach parents. Um, you know, we, we can't always, um, we might need to push more tailored um, information to them. Um, again, make it part of their dinner conversations. Um, but, um, you know, parents are in control of their own destiny and they're often not taking those important steps. You know, this Steve, is really Steve. interesting because I often wonder what happens to us. How, how did we, you know, um, Andrew, you've just talked about values and Julie, you talked about parents um, online safety being a concern, yet only 10%. What happens to where, where have we got it wrong? Do you know, one of the when during the pandemic, one of the evaluate one of the reports I was reading sometime either last year was saying that actually in the pandemic, children from a balanced home experience better mental well being. Mm -hmm. Reason being because their parents were finally at home and had to be at home. So children who were in a fairly stable family life, who prior to then had varying degrees of mental challenges, experienced much better stability as a result of parents just being present. So there's something about parental absenteeism that because that either that absenteeism has led to us disregarding in some way our own responsibilities and so easy to point the fingers elsewhere or wait until something goes terribly wrong and i personally worry beyond the online world conversation i worry that there is a ticking time bomb around mental health and young people and this abdication of duty that we see when it comes to the online world responsibility, I don't know what would happen if I'm projecting 10 years from now regarding children and mental well-being. Thank you, Tessie. And Go ahead, Julie. I was just going to say, well, and we're talking about, I guess, parents from nuclear families. Um, I think about what this means for vulnerable children children in foster care or out of home care um, who don't have engaged parents. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think we really need to think about um, intersectionality. We need to think about the fact that um, children uh, with disabilities, um, including, um, you know, on, on the spectrum, um, those from um, diverse backgrounds, are much more likely to face all forms of online harm. And if they don't have a trusted adult or a carer there to support them, we should all have concerns about, um, about their mental health. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, somebody said 10 years, uh, Tessie, you were saying, you know, you're worried about 10 years from now, what the mental health crisis is going to look like. In America, we have a mental health crisis right now for children. You can't get an appointment with a therapist. You certainly can't get an appointment with a psychiatrist. Um, and, you know, it was bad prior to the pandemic, but it is exponentially horrific right now, the situation we have. And I think there are a whole host of reasons for that. I, I, I just want to say, um, 
you know, I, I too struggle with uh, what's the matter with parents today? You remember that song, what's the matter with kids today? Um, but I also think it's really important that, that there are so many forces mitigating against parents' capacity to actually be the kind of parent they want to be. And then there's the other challenge, of course, of being the parent you want to be, raising your child, at least I'll speak from my own small experience, in a country, in a culture that has values that are exactly the opposite of mine in so many ways. And you can't protect your children from a lot of mis misogyny and racism and uh, gross inequities in how we live and who has what and access to the basic necessities of life. So I think that you know there, there are a lot of forces at play here that make life very, very challenging now and that can make technology extremely helpful and life-saving in some situations, but also pe put people at great risk at the same time. Um, one of the things I, I do believe that, that I do see happening, uh, that I think we could learn from, and unfortunately it's only happening in the most privileged schools in our country. Um, I've been able to do, do some work with, with uh, several schools, mostly private schools, where they are putting into place um, far more extensive mental health education, DEI work, SEL work, so diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, social, emotional intelligence, meditation, self-care. And my own thinking is that, frankly, we have to completely rethink the core curriculum. Like our core curriculum is so outdated. What our children, you know, every kid in America goes to school. There's gross inequity in the schools. But at least we know that's a touch point we have with all children in this country. We don't have touch points with guardians and parents in the same way. And I, I do believe that if we change the core and centered kids' mental health well-being, tech ethics, tech health, tech well-being, courageous conversations, where kids can practice talking with each other about what goes down online, one of the biggest reasons kids do not I do, one of the, my favorite questions to ask kids is, who do you turn to when there's bad stuff going on online, right? Who do you go to? So I still get the same answer I got 10 years ago from kids about why they don't go to their parents. The three adjectives, I would never go to my parents or my guardian or my grandmother, whoever I'm living with, they're too crazy, scary, or clueless. So scary parents go, you saw that online, I'm taking your computer away. You, know, you said that online, you're never going to get to college. You posted that picture, no one will ever speak to or want to marry you, whatever it is. Crazy parents see their, you know, their kid comes and says, oh my God, look, I wasn't invited to that party. And they go ballistic. They get more upset than their kids. You know, oh my God, I can't believe that. You know, that's not what kids need. They need you to stay calm, and be approachable and not get scary. And clueless parents are parents who do nothing. And that's sort of what we're talking about, right? My parents are so clueless, they wouldn't know how to help me. And sometimes kids say, it works for me because I can sneak around and do all this stuff. But more often than not, those are the most poignant voices to me because they listen to the other kids whose parents are doing safety, who are like, you know, checking on them when they come in at 11 o'clock to make sure they're not drunk or whatever. And there's envy, there's a longing. And so I see in kids the same thing I've always seen. They really want their parents to pay attention and connect to them. No, I would absolutely agree. I mean, definitely the report we've seen today and again, the study we've done, we're seeing it time and time again of young people, mm -hmm. particularly the kind of older teens who probably are the ones least likely for the parents to go and try and get involved. Um, uh, you know, not, not only do they want it in terms of the safety and the, the kind of giving the support, but actually they, it's a nice way for them to connect with their parents. Um, uh, and, and almost that's like, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to show you something like it's really embarrassing when you keep doing this wrong thing on Facebook. Let me show you how it actually works is actually for them sometimes, you know, quite an important step in that in that kind of building the relationship between parent and, and teen as well. Um, turning it on to some of the slightly more positive stuff. Catherine, when we spoke before, you talked a little bit about some of the kind of positive things you were seeing with young people kind of really standing up and, and, yeah. and you know, making a difference online. And Tessie, I'm going to throw the same sort of question to you as well, because you both work directly mm -hmm. in services supporting and, and talking with young people. So can you just give me a couple quick little examples of actually some of the positive things you've seen over the last couple of years, whether it be right. entrepreneurship or, or kind of, yeah, yeah, campaigning, whatever it is you've seen. 
Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I love some of the stuff I'm seeing kids doing. It just, I, I, you know, I can't believe it. So they're so creative and the opportunities they had. I certainly never had growing up. One of the things that's coming up, I, I also do research. I do research on the impact of tech on kids. One of the other areas I do research and have for many years are um, closing the leadership gap for girls. And my early research was actually on eating disorders and why they came in just at the same time when we were wanting to take up power and throw their weight around. You've seen a resurgence of that recently. But the thing that is most interesting to me recently that I'm coming across is the huge impact of activism online, particularly for girls. If you can get, you know, and, and schools are doing this with like eight-year-olds, you know, if, if you can make a difference, and Tessie, you talked about this, it came up in my research too, Tessie, that kids were broken hearted, they couldn't do anything about George Floyd, they couldn't do anything about helping their neighbors, how can you go online and deliver food, you know, they want to help. And we know this from mental health research, if you're depressed, the best thing you can do is go help somebody who's worse off than you. And in the, the child development sector, the opportunities to be an activist online are phenomenal. And when we are seeing, especially, you know, I, I'm tracking this more with girls, but it's absolutely true for anybody, however you identify, the opportunity to be an activist makes you think of yourself as somebody who can, with confidence and efficacy, make the world a better place. And that is what most kids want. I mean, they have more social justice in their hearts than we do. So I love how technology makes this possible across so many domains and the things that kids are doing today, the Girl Scout badges that kids are doing today to improve the world, to see you talk about what you're doing over there. But I find this thrilling and it is so tied to mental health and well-being. So the more we can bring this into kids' experiences, whether it's through scouting or education, school or family outreach, opportunities it's great wonderful tessie um yeah um briefly what sorts of things have you seen in that sort of positive um engagement with young people no i completely agree with Catherine. i think that one of the things we began to see especially globally actually right from about may last year we saw a shift particularly in response to the mother of george floyd there was a massive increase in youth engagement and activism. Young people began to say no, because I, I think it's fair to say there was almost a perfect storm. We were all at home, we were all online, and we saw stuff unfolding in our presence. And young people, what I saw on the back of that was young people began to organically create movements for change, harnessing particularly the power of digital technology. We saw young people across the world respond to something. You know, as adults, a lot of adults um, responded by saying, well, it's not here, it's not in my country, it's in America, we don't have to worry. Young people decided to say, if it's happening to one person, it's happening to me. Globally, mm -hmm. we saw that. We saw young people, in, in, in didn't matter the color of their skin, they just wanted to get up, have a voice and have a say. We see the same thing when it comes to climate change. We see how young people only last week were across Glasgow saying blah, 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 which began, which became the slogan of the conference. If you don't want real change, get out of the way because we are ready. And that for me, that was, there's a huge shift. And I'm loving the fact that young people are saying, does it matter what parts of the world they live in? They're saying, we want to, the future is ours. We want to be part of the decision making. We're tired of adults making decisions that sometimes turn out wrong. So you would see young people either in Westminster or, or rural Wales, the Highlands or Northern Ireland, beginning to take action and create change. We, very briefly, we saw some of that last year. And interestingly, we saw young people bring themselves together, began to talk about using, you know, breaking stereotypes, using their own lived experience, whether it was mental health and saying, this is, you know, I don't want to, um, there's been, you know, there's been, I've seen a move where young people are saying, don't use me as a speaker, don't bring me out, don't wheel me out as a signpost to show your, your services if you are not being authentic. Young people began to call out services that were only paying lip service to youth engagement. And I've seen a lot of that lately. And we're even, even as, as an organization, we're examining ourselves, making sure that 
we're not being tokenistic when it comes to youth boys because young people are what we're seeing is young people saying i'm not gonna do x if you're being tokenistic we want to see authenticity brands who are being tokenistic they're saying we're not we're gonna boycott you and that's the power of youth activism but also the power the fact that the platform that young people feel seen feel visible using the power of digital tech tech amazing thank you and i think that's a really positive thing and definitely the goal of this conversation was to look at those things that we can embrace and continue into the new normal which we're going to touch on in a minute so i think that's definitely something i would encourage all of us to be thinking about is how we encourage and support people to have that voice um, i've got two topics i really want to touch on before we go to q a um, so one of them is kind of oh, such a huge topic and certainly is taking up a lot of my time at the moment and just looking at the fact that online safety regulation uh, legislation the changes around the world here in the uk we've had age appropriate design code and the online uh, safety bill that's coming in and uh, i know julie there's stuff in australia if you can very briefly explain what that is in just a second but um say so just if we can keep it all short but just a quick think about you know in some ways i think we'd all agree it's really amazing that it's having this moment that everybody whether it's policymakers or, or the public is starting to to really think about this stuff but um what do you think is really going to make a difference moving forward out of everything that you're seeing at the moment is there anything that stands out to any of you um in particular and julie just um if you can give us a two minutes on what's happening specifically in australia that would be great Sure. Um, well, we've been regulating for online harms, as I said, for the past six years. Um, we've got a, a few different regulatory schemes. The, the first is a serious cyberbullying scheme for um, anything threatening, humiliating, harassing, or intimidating um, directed at a child. And that does require the child or a parent or, or carer to report to the platform first. And that's for a few reasons. One, we want to encourage kids to be using blocking and reporting um, mechanisms online. And we've seen over the past three years that 20% are, are, are doing more of that. Again, that's a form of agency. But it's also the platform's responsibility, and it's the most expeditious way to get down. But the role we play is as a safety net. So if uh, and and we know that content moderators are dealing with you know millions of pieces of content. They miss context. They miss cultural cues. Things fall through the crack. So we actually advocate on behalf of our citizens, and we bridge that inherent power balance that um, exists. Um, and so we have a 90% uh, success rate working collaboratively with the platforms in terms of getting serious cyberbullying content taken down. Uh, we haven't had to issue removal notices or fine platforms or even use um, end user notices to perpetrators, but we have those powers. Um, we have an image-based abuse scheme where we remove intimate images and videos and we have an 85% percent success rate getting these uh, this kind of content taken down from websites all over the world. Um, and um, we we also are the hotline like NECMEC or IWF. We take down uh, child sexual abuse uh, material uh, as well as um, pro-terrorist content. So all of those are working. We have abhorrent violent content materials in the wake of the uh, live streamed Christchurch um, uh, event and we have a 93% success rate in terms of getting gore content or kidnapping torture content all from overseas sites in permissive hosting environments. But we're fair, we're balanced and we use this proportionately. I guess if, if you go back to Roosevelt and the big stick policy, it's really about speaking softly, working collaboratively or with the carrot if you will where you can, um, and then calling out, naming and shaming, or using those graduative sets of tools um, in line with the, the level of harm as you need them. And what Parliament has done in July this year is they've given us uh, a stronger set of powers and a lot, a lot bigger sticks. Um, the first is that we will now have a serious adult cyber abuse scheme. So for the first time anywhere in the world, um, we'll be looking at, um, we need to balance a set of fundamental rights, freedom of expression and freedom of speech. But what I've observed over the years, and I particularly saw this at Twitter, with unfettered and or unbridled free speech, when it's targeted misogyny, hatred, racism, homophobia, it's designed to silence voices. And um, we know from talking to vulnerable um, in individuals and communities, that they do self-censor or they won't utilize technology. And now that with COVID, 
the internet has become uh, an essential utility. We need to make sure as many people are using technology in positive ways as possible. It's, it's about empowerment. It's about an opportunity. And we have to remember that um, marginalized voices already, um, this marginalization, this vulnerability is being entrenched. So where um, serious cyber is targeting a specific individual, um, there, there are two actually objective tests. We have to prove serious intent to harm and that it will be menacing, harassing objective in all cases. But I, I can just tell you three months after um, going from being the Children's E-Safety Commissioner to the uh, E-Safety Commissioner covering all um, citizens, we've had three times more informal adult cyber abuse reports than we have youth-based cyberbullying reports. So there's a huge issue, uh, as we all know, with trolling. So um, this is a bold new social experience experiment. We're going to take this on. Our powers extend beyond social media to online gaming platforms, to dating sites, um, you know, search, um, and even utilizing um, you know the the app stores as as a choke point when rogue apps are being hosted. We have new codes, and then we have something called the BOS, or the Basic Online Safety Expectations, where um, we effectively um, expect companies who are operating and delivering services into Australia online that they're doing the very basic as a license to operate. You know, do they have report abuse functionality? Um, do they have policies, people, and processes in place? Um, and if it's not clear that they're tackling wicked problems like volumetric targeted abuse or dealing with them, um, you know, enforcing their real names policies or fake and imposter policies, um, preventing recidivism, so bad actors continuing to return, we can issue either periodic transparency reports or um, specific transparency reports because that's the other thing I think that's been missing is we, we're seeing more selective transparency than we are radical transparency, and we need both transparency and accountability if we are going to create a safer online world. Thanks, Julie. Andy, um, obviously I'm very mindful of time, and I've got one more question I want to come to before we open the Q&A, but I would just like to ask you, in terms of you know the work that you're doing, looking at all of these different regulatory things being discussed, is there one that you think could be really, really beneficial and effective, or is it a bit too early to tell? Um, I, this is a, a very difficult question. Um, I, I think we're entering a, a really dangerous period uh, when it comes to regulation, um, a, a really fraught period. Um, I, I think that we have a fundamentally miscalibrated risk tolerance. Um, I think that, that metaphors like auto safety are used. Um, and it completely ignores what we know about the risks that as a society uh, we incur to enjoy the, the freedoms and liberties we, we have. Um, in this country, in the UK, about 50 kids go to the A&E, the, the emergency room, every day because of tr serious trampoline-related injuries. Um, and, 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 and adding safeguards on a trampoline and, and the parents' attention on a trampoline is fundamentally different than altering their free speech rights and rights of association and play uh, in mind space. And so in many instances, a banner to protect mental health without evidence is used to turn the internet off for eight hours a day in South Korea for nine damn years. And nobody bothered to check if it saved anyone's sleep. It saved a minute and 23 seconds of sleep for the average South Korean teenager. And we have decisions from the World Health Organization that meant uh, and, and Chinese authorities meant, meant to, to limit cyber addiction, which is a phony baloney concept in any scientific way. And so I, I'm terrified that if we enter a, a, a realm of trying to mitigate risks that we've never measured in the first place, uh, we're not going to know if any of the steps we take are actually effective beyond reporting some headline numbers. And in the meantime, people who can't use real names because of their gender identity or political affiliations uh, won't be able to express themselves if the government works with private industry to turn off a form of communication that, that prohibits it. And if everyone gets really great at protesting online and they never learn how to do it in real life, then when that gets turned off, all the resilience in the democratic system falls away. And so I, I, I don't think we can pay lip surface liberty without understanding and having a, 
a reasonable expectations of what risks we will adopt as a society. And that has to be a democratic decision that isn't taken between a regulator and, and a company that needs profits. It's one that we need to have in the civic square. Thank you for being polite. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Um, so we're really, really short on time. And I know we have a couple of questions I definitely want to get to. Um, very quickly, I just want to give the results to the poll that we had. Uh, the question was, what is the most important priority that we will bring to creating a new normal? Um, and it was a pretty close um, uh, um, result in terms of, so the number one was the value of positive online conduct, which I think we've really touched on here, um, but the ability to enable a better work-life balance was a very close runner-up. And I think that kind of touched on what we were saying earlier about, you know, families being together and actually having that time to connect and how, how important that was. Literally in 30 seconds each, we're looking at the phrase, the new normal. We still don't know what that's going to look like. But when we reflect on all the things we've seen over the last couple of years and, and the things that we've discussed today, could you each, as I say, in 30 seconds, just give me an idea of, you know, what you'd love to see us take from that learning and, and a positive something that you hope we can, we can move forward with, please. I'm going to start with you, Tessie. Oh, why did I know you were going to start with me? Oh, God, 30 seconds. OK, so, so for me, new normal must mean that we retain this accessibility that we, as, as, like I said, the digital world, the last few months has shown that actually lots of people who've been excluded from participation because participation only happened in certain places meant that everyone, more people have been involved. Young, there's been sparks across the country. New normal must mean that we never lose that. That actually what we do is that we constantly look to create the environment for things like that to thrive, even if we have to engineer it sometimes. For me, new normal must mean that whilst we we create this balance that allows us to look, we are human and there is fragility, whether we accept our, our fragility or not, but our new normal must allow for for our well, our mental well-being to to thrive, that we build in whatever fast-paced walls we're creating, that we build in three things, that we never lose these three things: the ability to check in and connect with one another, the ability to build community that fosters belongingness, and that the ability to just have that conversation that says, "How are you?" irrespective of what we are pursuing, that this new normal must retain these things because we are human life is fragile and we can never replace our lives so we look after ourselves I see that was a beautiful answer and it was way over 30 seconds I, love I know <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what I'm gonna get try and do one of the questions we've had from the audience that if we have time um for anyone else to contribute to that answer I think that would be the right thing to do um so one of the questions we had was how can we encourage civility online when everything is anonymous uh, won't there always be an issue with that? So Andy, seeing as you mentioned anonymity, I'm going to throw that to you first. I, I think we need to decide as a society if we want that as a goal. We have many goals not to destroy our planet. Uh, and maybe that's not actually an important one for us to tackle. Uh, and I'll answer the previous question in 15 seconds <laughs> and say when the pandemic hit, uh, we we locked ourselves away in, in our homes and we found ourselves surrounded by worlds built by companies and it wasn't built by our society. And we need to decide about whether or not we want to do something about that. Okay, that's a good answer. Um, I'm going to throw the other question out. So um, the research this morning showed young people are often teaching their parents more about online safety than the parents are teaching them. How does that change the importance of role modeling by adults? Catherine, I'm going to come to you first, and then Julie, if you'd also like to answer that one. Well, the, the importance of role modeling by adults means adults have to understand and observe their own behavior. Um, and I think that's, <laughs> that's a problem. When I, when I work with parents, I often work with their kids first and say, what are the things your parents do that drive you nuts? And then I just tell the parents, these are your kids. I mean, you don't need to go to broad research, right? They ask a question. How is school today, honey? Oh, wait, I just have to check something. You know, there you go. I mean, the norms we've created because of the way our brains interact with the thing are, are rude, right? So we have to like wake up and think about, you know, what's your brain like on your smartphone? And, you know, I'm going to go back to the previous question. One thing I do see, and I think it's really important, and it can happen in schools, and it certainly can hopefully happen more at home, 
is that um, the more we can teach kids about tech ethics, about ethics, about kindness, about empathy, and to normalize being an upstander, one of the things that came through in the research is it's very hard, and we know this, I mean, we've known this with teasing and research on teasing and social cruelty and human behavior. Uh, with anonymity, there is more, uh, people take more risks, not, you know, not the right kinds of risks, being mean and cruel. I think when, when subgroups online, we see this in gaming, we see this in different platforms, when they create a, a culture where it's not cool to be cruel, where you are called out, where you're kicked out, you know, those are the things we want to really strengthen and, and fortify in our kids. And I think schools, that one of the biggest problems is kids are at a loss. If they tell somebody at school they've been bullied online, that kid is probably going to get kicked out or disciplined or not, you know, not the kid who complained, the bully. We need to teach children and make it practice at home and at families how to be an upstander online, how to be kind, and that it, we want to reward, you know, the, the, the kind moves more. So they spread more quickly, five times as fast as the hateful or false, you know, facts. So I think we need to change the culture. And that's incumbent upon all of us. Thank you, Catherine. I'm really sorry, Julie. We have run out of time on our panel, so I wasn't able to come but to I, you. I but... want to talk about the different new normal. <laughs> oh, well, we, we'll, we'll all have to reconvene another panel tomorrow. Let's do it again. This is fantastic. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you for the fantastic conversation. I knew this would happen, that we would just have so much to talk about, but it really has been fascinating. I'm really grateful for you all sharing your insights. Um, and, you know, once again, thank you to Fozy for, for bringing everybody together for this discussion. I hope everyone found it really helpful and, and interesting. Um, I'm going to hand back to Stephen now. Well, thank you so much, Laura. And gosh, I would prefer to just let this panel keep going, but uh, unfortunately we are out of time. Um, I am looking forward to re-watching this once we post this session all, and all the other sessions up on our YouTube channel. So um, that's coming soon. Um, so this brings us to the very final session of the day. It's a chance to engage with each other via the networking feature. Uh, to visit the exhibitors one last time, um, or even just to connect with each other directly. Um, uh, please, please, please fill out the survey forms that we sent out a few moments ago. Um, the surveys from last year helped us to build the agenda for this year, so it's extremely important you do that. Um, but before you go, I would like to say a final few words. Um, <clears throat> I began the day by saying that we wanted to look at the ways in which we can renew our sense of community, both on and offline, when so many factors have forced us apart. Um, so many of the panels and plenaries touched on this sense of renewal and pointed to new possibilities for reconnecting in healthy and safe ways, while remaining mindful of the myriad risks and real harms that children and young people deal with every day. But let's not be overwhelmed. Through all that we've seen and heard today, let's find a way to courageously recover and renew our faith in each other, our children and our communities. Let's build resilience in ourselves and the social fabric that holds us together. Let us show by example how to model this recovery for our kids to follow. And as the research has found, has found, let's allow our teens and young people to teach us about the tools they are already using to stay safe and private and secure online. And let's pause and think carefully about what the next five to 10 years will look like. As we heard earlier, uh, or I guess what was urged earlier this afternoon, we need a better verse, not just a multiverse, one that is built, maintained, and enjoyed in a safe and secure way. Way, way earlier this morning, Tiffany Schlein said that our devices and apps lead us to want more. And she said unplugging allows us to see what's right in front of us and to be grateful for that. Here at FOSI, we will continue the work of building a culture of responsibility online where governments, 
industry, law enforcement, parents, teachers, and the kids themselves have different but overlapping areas of responsibility to make the online world safer, more civil, and compassionate. So please join me in thanking our very generous sponsors who through their financial support gave us the opportunity to host this gathering today. To our wonderful speakers, panelists, and moderators who shed so much light on the wide range of issues that we are facing. To our exhibitors for illustrating and discussing with us the products and services they have created to be part of the solution. To the good folks at the Hopin platform uh, and our video production company, CVW, for all their technical and logistical support. And to the ever amazing FOSI staff team who turned on a dime back in the summer to convert what was supposed to be a large physical conference into a virtual one without skipping a beat. My deep gratitude goes out to Emily Mulder, Maria Conticelli, Kelsey Hegarty, Andrew Zach, Jonathan Bridgman, and Aaron McCowie, and of course, our wonderful events consultant, Stephanie Condello. And lastly, my thanks to all of you for the tireless work that you do, whether in a government agency, a tech company, or an NGO, whether you're an educator, a researcher, a student activist, or just a hardworking parent, thank you for all that you do to be resilient and to recover from adversity with grace and for making the online world safer for kids and all of our families. Be well, stay safe, and COVID willing, we'll see you in person next year. Goodbye. <laughs>